Hey, Darren Grimes for Real Britain every Saturday and Sunday from 2 p.m. A news hour that comes with a trigger warning. Scorching hot opinion with prominent guests saying the unsayable and a little bit of weekend fun thrown in. Unlike other broadcasters, I won't be forgetting what the B in our name stands for. So how are you in for Real Britain Saturday and Sunday from 2 p.m.? GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome. You're tuned in to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes, on telly and live on DAB. We'll be reflecting on the Queen testing positive for COVID at the age of 95. Also, would you support fracking in an attempt to lower your energy bills? It's going to be a busy one, but first, it's the news with Ray Addison. Thanks, Darren. It's one minute past two. Buckingham Palace has confirmed that the Queen has tested positive for COVID. In a statement, the Palace said Her Majesty is experiencing mild, cold-like symptoms but expects to carry out light duties this week. The head of state, who's 95 years old, tested positive after coming in direct contact with her eldest son and heir, the Prince of Wales, the week he had the virus. The announcement comes just a few weeks after Her Majesty reached her historic Platinum Jubilee, marking 70 years on the throne. Buckingham Palace says she will continue to receive medical attention and follow all appropriate guidelines. Royal editor Robert Jobson told GB News he believes she should not be carrying out light work while she's unwell. I think in this particular instance they've taken the decision based upon her being the head of state and her great age and to try to alert to a lot of fears, really, and to uh, keep people calm and not worried. But at the same time, as I say, it's easy to sort of almost dismiss this because the Queen does seem almost indestructible. But I just hope that the focus, as I said, is on health and not her showing that she's keeping calm and carrying on because sometimes the priority has to be health. Well, meanwhile, Grant Harold, the former royal butler to Prince Charles, Prince William and Prince Harry, explained how he felt when he heard the news. It was that shock of, I hope she's okay, literally, you know, that, that shock, um, just praying that, 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 she, that she'll be okay. And thankfully, obviously, the palace has, have said it's mild symptoms. But the other thing that amazed me was the palace have actually made this announcement quite quickly because, as you know, they don't very often give out kind of notices about the members of their family and their health. This is quite significant. They've actually let everyone know at this stage that she has contracted the virus. 
Meanwhile, the legal requirement to self-isolate if you test positive for COVID is set to end this week. Downing Street says the Prime Minister will lift the restriction by Friday as part of his, of his Living with Covid plan. He'll tell MPs that the vaccine programme, testing and new treatments can be relied upon to keep the public safe. Senior NHS managers have criticised the move. The Prime Minister has warned that a Russian invasion of Ukraine would be the biggest conflict in Europe since World War II. This morning, explosions were heard in the rebel-held city of Donetsk in the east of the country, and the military reported the death of two soldiers. President Vladimir Zelensky is calling for talks with Russia's Vladimir Putin in a bid to ease tensions. Boris Johnson says if there's an incursion, the death toll could be huge. I'm afraid to say that the, the plan that we're seeing is for something that could be really the, the biggest war in Europe since 1945, in, just in terms of sheer scale. Uh, I think people need to understand the, the sheer cost in human life that that could entail, uh, and not just for Ukrainians, but also for, for Russians and for, for young Russians. And am, an amber weather warning has been issued for Northern Ireland, with Storm Franklin hitting the UK today. It comes just two days after Storm Eunice caused what providers say was the biggest national power outage on record. Around 155,000 people are still without electricity. Yellow weather warnings are also in place for Wales and most of England, with winds of up to 70 miles per hour expected to cause more problems. A passenger who was among 12 missing people has been rescued from a burning ferry. Rescuers discovered the survivor on the stern of the vessel as it was being towed towards Corfu. The fire on the Italian-flagged Euroferry Olympic, which was sailing from Greece to Italy, started in the early hours of Friday morning. 11 people are still unaccounted for. A helicopter has crashed dangerously close to swimmers on a crowded beach in Miami. No one on the beach was injured, but two of the three people on board were taken to hospital. They're said to be in a stable condition. And they've done it. Great Britain has won its first Olympic curling gold medal in 20 years. The women's team dominated the final against Japan to win 10-3. Captain Eve Muihead says that it was a proud moment. It's phenomenal. Um, it's a moment that, that we're going to remember forever. This team has put in a fantastic shift this week. We're, we're very proud of each other. And, yeah, we can't wait to celebrate together. Even you heard there. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. Now let's get back to Real Britain with Darren Grimes. Hello, folks. Thank you very much for your company. I'm joined now by royal commentator Daisy McAndrew to actually reflect on the Queen testing positive for COVID. Daisy, what has the reaction been so far? Are we all just in a sort of state of shock, actually, because, the you know, this is our head of state, ultimately? I think there obviously is a lot of alarm because people have already been coming to terms with the fact that uh, the Queen hasn't been very well over the last few months, has missed a number of very important high profile engagements. You'll remember, Darren, COP26 was one, Remembrance Service in November uh, was another. And the palace was slightly um, caught at, during that time because it didn't appear to be telling us the whole truth about uh, the monarch's state of health, assuring us that she hadn't been to hospital when it turned out she had been to hospital and so on. So I think there is also a bit today of people saying, well, at least they are keeping us informed. And as you all know, anybody who watches uh, the royal family knows that there is this balance, particularly when it comes to the head of state, of how much do they tell us of her private medical details, how much do they feel we should be allowed to know, and how much reassurance do they want to give? Because, of course, there is an issue of trust. Do we trust what we hear Buckingham Palace is telling us? So I think they've tried to be on the front foot on this last week when Prince Charles and then his wife Camilla both tested positive. Positive. They were quick to tell us then, but they weren't so keen on telling us whether the Queen was taking, for instance, daily tests, whether she was doing lateral flows every day, whether those results were coming back negative. Now we know she has tested positive, although, again, 
reassuring signs coming out in this statement that we got uh, just a short time ago saying she's only experiencing currently uh, low level symptoms like a cold. Yeah, and a lot of people are asking the question here. Obviously, the monarch turns 96 in April. Was it inevitable, actually, that the Queen was going to catch a highly transmissible variant, if it is indeed, of course, the Omicron variant, which has been infecting most of the country, hasn't it, Daisy, at this, at this present moment? I don't think anybody felt it was inevitable because we're told that every precaution was being taken. Of course, it wasn't. She hasn't been living as she was during the height of the pandemic before she was triple vaccinated, as we know she is now. In those days, I don't know if you remember, she was at Windsor Castle. She was in what was nicknamed HMS Bubble with her husband, Prince Philip, and just about 20 members of staff looking after her, carrying on doing her red boxes and her duties. Um, since then, of course, she has been seeing more people and she did have um, some audiences in the real world rather than on Zoom in the last week. The timing, we know that Prince Charles saw her the Tuesday before last and then contracted or got his positive test two days later. So that was really when people were most nervous, thinking, did he pass it on to his mother, as he obviously did do to Camilla? And I think people had subsequently thought, well, we're over that gestation period. So fingers crossed she's got away with it. She hasn't got COVID. Then, of course, the news broke today. There's nothing to say that, that she won't continue just getting low level symptoms uh, of a common cold. But having had some health problems over the last few months and knowing, you know, she is, as you said, 95 going on 96. The pictures we saw of her just a few days ago, she did actually say to her guests, um, I can't walk. She was leaning quite heavily uh, onto her cane. So for a 95 year old, she's in very good health. But of course, she is 95 and she is frail. I mean, ultimately, Daisy, honestly, the, the monarch is in better nick than I am. But, you know, she was saying, you're right, she pointed to these mobility problems. She actually pointed at her leg with that walking stick and said, well, as you can see, I can't move. So there does seem to, I, a lot of people are looking at the, the Queen now at the almost the age of 96 and thinking, well, you know, the older the monarch gets, the more people get worried about this sort of story. Even as you say, it might be mild symptoms. And of course, the Queen saying in that true British spirit, I'm going to get on with light duties. Yes, and she will want to be seen. One of the Queen's mottos is to be seen is to be believed. And what she means by that is if she's going to be trusted, if people are going to look up to her and give her the respect that the royal family wants her to get, they have to see her performing her duties, see her out in the public. I mean, just a small thing, one of the reasons she always wears such bright clothes is to be seen because, of course, she is diminutive and she knows that when she's in the days when she was allowed to be, out in very large crowds, people wanted to be able to say to their friends and family, I saw the Queen, which is why she's always in these very garish colours and so on. So it's very important to the Queen and the whole of the royal family that they are seen out and about, not seen to be hiding away. And we know that during lockdown, during uh, the height of the epidemic, that she found it very frustrating that she wasn't being able to do what she's normally able to do, being out and about, fulfilling her responsibilities responsibilities and duties. And of course, we'll now have to see how much Prince Charles and Prince William will have to step in doing more um, of her roles. I know you were talking to uh, Robert Jobson, a fantastic royal commentator himself, who was urging the Queen to take it easy. And I think all of us have sympathy with that. But we also know that won't be her instinct. Her instinct will be to try to brush this off as fast as possible and get back to the job in hand whilst listening to her doctors. Of course, she has, you know, the royal family has their private uh, doctors, the, the, the by royal assent at Windsor, she's got her private GP, who's known as the apothecary uh, of Windsor Castle. She is surrounded by medics. But of course, presumably she's now contagious. So they are all going to have to be very, very careful uh, being around the Queen, who will obviously have to be in some form of isolation whilst being looked after. So it is going to be a very tricky few days ahead. Lots of concern. 
And of course, she's not just a much loved member of the royal family. As you said, she is the head of state and she has responsibilities. When new legislation comes in, she must give it royal assent. If she's not able to do that, uh, then her son and grandson, Prince Charles and Prince William, will have to do that on her behalf. So she's not just a titular head of state. She's a working head of state with many duties to fulfil. I mean, you could say that again, you know, the Queen works every single day, right? This is a, a monarch that never stops. But Daisy, just very briefly, we are so much further on in what we know about this virus and how we re respond to this virus with antivirals and all of the rest of it. So we're in a much better position now than we would have been at the start of the pandemic two years ago, right? Of course, but also there is a political element to this story. You know, I've been on the radio this morning talking about the fact that Boris Johnson is going to be announcing his so-called, as he would call it, Freedom Day tomorrow, that by the end of this week, he wants all restrictions, COVID restrictions to be lifted. Now, what does this do? to that policy because of course although 95 year old woman gets covid has had triple jabbed perhaps wouldn't make a big difference to public policy to a political uh, policy it just might make people think is this really wise at the moment the latest yougov poll um, about lifting these restrictions specifically the restriction the mandated restriction that if you have a COVID positive result, you have to self-isolate for five days. That policy being lifted is actually not very popular with the public. Now you and I could, could argue and disagree and could talk about that till the cows come home, but the public is frightened. 75% in that recent poll said they don't want that policy to be lifted. Now you add in the queen, the most high profile woman or person in this country succumbing to COVID and it actually might affect public opinion even more. I think this is going to make life for the Conservative Party in Boris Johnson's announcement tomorrow slightly trickier. Yeah, well, we'll see. Royal commentator Daisy McAndrew, thank you very much for your time today. I can now say I'm dead excited to speak to Lady Colin Campbell, a royal author who has published seven books about the royal family. Lady Colin, worrying news for the Queen in a hugely important year for her, isn't it? Well, I hope that it's going to get the message across to people that the Queen is a human being and being a human being who is 90. Two, two months short of 96, she's frail. And does she really need to have all of the world's manure dumped on her doorstep the way she's been having it recently? So I, I would hope that those of us who have respect for the Queen as our beloved head of state, will, will, maybe people will get the message that now's the time for a bit more appreciation and a little bit less Specialization and abuse. Yeah, I mean, Lady Colin, do you agree with that? We had Daisy McAndrew on just before yourself, and she was saying actually she thinks that this is going to create a political headache for the government because a lot of people will be saying, well, hang on a minute, how can we lift COVID restrictions at a time when our monarch has now caught the virus? Well, I'm awfully sorry. With due respect, I think the lady's chatting utter rubbish. The fact of the matter is, the fact that I know many people who have had COVID are who are one who's 96 years old. The Queen isn't 96 quite yet. And uh, and he was perfectly okay. Uh, I think we should listen to the doctor who discovered this variant, Omicron, a South African doctor, who said that she thought it would be in the world's interest that as many people as possible caught it. And, you know, we really need to understand at some point that the government's duty is not to protect us against, against health. It is to protect us against corruption and against wrongdoing. You know, the, 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 the government's... Uh, the, Omicron is a perfectly standard form of flu. It's not even a very strong form of flu. Are we going to have the pusillanimous little creatures that want to deprive us of our civil liberties, keeping on preaching to us 
and telling us that the world needs to shut down and that the government's duty is to protect us against catching a, a variation of flu that is not that is not going to harm most of us. And if the Queen dies, and I have to tell you, I hope she's she lives a long and healthy life. But you know, she is ninety five. And on that point, die. Lady Colin, on that point, do you think that Her Majesty the Queen, the statement from the palace saying actually the Queen will be getting on with lighter duties, that keep calm and carry on spirit, that it, she's certainly, I think, given the nation since she was a mechanic in the war to this point now, do you think that message of I will be getting on even though I have coronavirus is actually what the nation needs to hear, right? That we can Absolutely. learn to live with this virus. Absolutely. Absolutely. We need to start to show a, a bit of stoicism. And she is showing the British people that we need to get back in touch with proper British virtues like stoicism, getting on with the business of living, doing your duty and taking the consequences. You know, it's, it was one thing when people thought that COVID might be like Ebola and would kill practically everybody. Now it has become apparent that in fact COVID is not like that, even at its most intense, and that the variants are now very mild. We need to get on with the business of living, and the Queen is showing us and good, good to, for her that we need to simply get on with the business of living and man up and woman up. You know, well, yeah. no, we don't need any more of this pusillanimity. It's just ridiculous, you know. At some point, people need to understand that the natural consequence of life is death and that governments are not there to preserve us from all dangers, from real danger, yes, but from something that's not dangerous. I mean, give me a break, you know. We should be listening to what the Queen is saying. She, she is saying she's getting on with the business of reigning and she is getting on with the business of trying to get better and she's getting on with the business of being ill and she is not making a fuss about it. We could do with a little bit less hysteria in this country at this point. And I have to tell you, I think that it does us as a nation and as individuals no good to succumb to cowardly hysteria. Well, Lady Colin, no holding back as usual. Thank you very much for your time, Lady Colin Campbell. Now, there's plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. We're going to continue to discuss the Queen testing positive. But first, let's have a look at the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking wet and windy as Storm Franklin begins to move into the northwest. Let's take a look at the details. Zooming into the southwest and the afternoon rain will have cleared, leaving a mix of clear spells and blustery showers. It'll be windy with gales along the coast. Across the southeast, it'll be a very wet start to the evening with some gusty winds around as well. The rain should turn more showery later on. Over to Wales now and here we'll see plenty of showers, some of which will be wintry especially over the mountains. Widespread gales are also likely around the coast. Let's head over to the Midlands and northwest of England, where we'll see plenty of showers this evening, but again, some being rather wintry over higher ground. It'll feel chilly as well, especially in the strong winds. Northeast England will get a little bit of shelter from the showers, but some will make their way across the Pennines. Winds will not feel as strong here, but it will be quite chilly too. Over in Scotland, there'll be plenty of showers, with some feeling wintry at times. Even at fairly lower levels, the strongest winds will be across the southwest with gales here. Turning to Northern Ireland now, and the winds here will continue to strengthen this evening with severe gales possible later. An amber warning will also come into a force later on tonight. OK, over tonight, Storm Franklin will continue with plenty of showers, very strong winds, especially across the northwest of the country. That's how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow. Join me, Nana Aquir, on Fridays, Saturdays and Sunday afternoons here on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as my panel and I take on some of the top stories hitting the headlines. You can look up the statistics. No, you look it up. I hug everyone. Oh. We'll learn from it and try and yeah. move on. That's it. <laughs> Opinion 
was at the heart of the show. It's a place for open and frank conversation, but without the fear of cancellation. So join me here on GB News on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons between 4 and 6 p.m. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Thank you so much for your company. The Queen has tested positive for COVID and in a statement, the palace has said that Her Majesty is experiencing mild cold-like symptoms, but expects to carry on light duties this week. The announcement comes weeks after the Queen became the UK's longest reigning monarch, reaching her platinum jubilee of 70 long years. Fantastic. Though she is. Our reporter Ellie Costello is in Windsor and she joins us now. Ellie, what's the mood like there? What are you picking up from royal sources? Well, good afternoon, Darren. Yes, the mood here is of concern. There is a small crowd just gathering outside Windsor Castle. Many people have come up to me in the last few minutes whilst I've been setting up and asking how the Queen is. Of course, uh, we don't have an update. We only have that statement from Buckingham Palace just a few hours ago. But the, the air here is certainly one of concern, Darren. And we did get that statement from Buckingham Palace just a few hours ago. It said Buckingham Palace confirm uh, that the Queen has today tested positive for COVID. They say that she is experiencing mild, cold-like symptoms, which will be a relief to many. And they also says that she does expect to continue light duties at Windsor over the coming weeks. I am at Windsor Castle now. Her Majesty will be inside those castle walls somewhere recovering with the very best medical attention. We do know that she has her own physician. It's Professor Hugh Thomas. It's understood that he is the man in charge of her care and she will be receiving uh, the very best care from him. Uh, but like you said, Darren, this just comes a few weeks after she became Britain's longest serving monarch when she celebrated her platinum jubilee. And we know how stoic and hardworking the Queen is. This will come at much frustration to her uh, that she has had to step aside uh, from her duties. We saw her in public undertaking a large, uh, a big duty, a big public uh, gathering for the very first time at the start of this month. 
months. She had been told to rest uh, for, th for three months um, after her, her health became poorer before Christmas. We saw her at the beginning of the month. It looked as though she was starting to get back into her stride. So it will be very frustrating uh, for Her Majesty that she will now uh, have to take the rest that she uh, so dearly needs. But we do need to remember that this is a 95-year-old woman that we are speaking about. She was suffering with ill health before Christmas. She has been advised to rest. Uh, and now she she has, we have been confirmed today, she has tested positive for coronavirus uh, and will be recovering here at Windsor Castle. Ellie, what are these light duties that you mentioned there? What, what will the Queen be doing during this time? Well, we do know uh, that the Queen has been taking precautions in the past week. She has been meeting ambassadors. She met two on Thursday via video link, and she was taking precautions because uh, she had met with Prince Charles, who just two days later tested positive for coronavirus. And his wife, the Duchess of Cornwall, has since tested positive too. Now, we know that Prince Charles has made a full recovery. The Duchess of Cornwall is still self-isolating, but the Queen has has indeed tested positive. No confirmation that that did come from that meeting with Prince Charles, but she has been taking precautions since that meeting on the 8th of February, just in case she was carrying the virus. So she has been meeting ambassadors via video link, Darren. We can imagine that is the sort of thing that she will continue to do uh, while she recovers from coronavirus. But one thing that I think we can take from this statement, Darren, is the fact that the statement reads she is suffering from mild symptoms, mild cold-like symptoms and the fact that the statement reads that she will be undertaking light duties, I think they are both intentionally included to make sure that we don't panic and to make, make it clear that the Queen is in the best place for her health and is receiving, of course, the very best care. That's Ellie Costello in Windsor. Thank you very much for that update. Now, let's go back to our reporter, Cameron Walker, our royal reporter, who, as some more politicians have actually been tweeting about this update from the palace. Cameron, what do we actually know so far? What We hear there from Ellie that the Queen will be getting on with those light duties. Do you actually take this as the Queen saying, you know, I'm going to keep calm and carry on? Well, I think the fact, Darren, that Buckingham Palace said in their statement that she is going to be continuing light duties does suggest that the virus at this point isn't affecting her that much. And I think, you, as you said, that kind of British kind of thought of keep calm and carrying on is one that very much has run through her um, all her life. But let me just take you back uh, to how this all kind of started earlier this morning. So it was around 11.45 that Buckingham Palace released this statement. Uh, and we do know that to say that she has tested positive for coronavirus. We do know that she was in direct contact with the Prince of Wales the week he had the disease and he emerged from isolation on Thursday and that was the second time in fact he has had the disease and COVID symptoms can appear from 2 to 14 days after exposure to the virus and a palace source actually told me this morning that a number of people within the Windsor Castle staff have tested positive as well suggesting that Prince Charles may not have been the one to expose the Queen to the virus. But people are understandably concerned. She is 95 years old. She turns 96 in April, but we are led to believe that she has had her three coronavirus jabs. Um, and it was just a few weeks ago that um, Her Majesty celebrated becoming uh, Britain, well, she's Britain's longest reigning monarch and she celebrated her platinum jubilee of 70 years on the throne. And I have no doubt, Darren, that palace officials are still very much uh, planning for her Platinum Jubilee celebration weekend in June. Cameron, does this break with protocol then? You mentioned there that, the, the, you know, it's assumed that the Queen has had all three of those jabs. How common is it for the palace to actually put out a statement that says, yes, the Queen has X and uh, this is what we're doing about it? How, you know, how many times have you been aware of the palace actually being as explicit as they have been today? Well, I think when it comes to the Queen's health or any member of the royal family's health for that matter, they do always maintain a sense of privacy. But I think the difference here with coronavirus specifically, well, I remember actually this time, well, last year, the Queen actually went into hospital for um, a prelim preliminary investigations. That's what the palace told us. But they were very reluctant to tell us that was the case to start with. I think, in fact, many royal, um, uh, royal journalists were... Um, 
contacting the palace asking that question and they denied it. It only emerged when a paper broke the story and they had to admit the fact that she was in hospital. And I think the palace got a lot of criticism for that. So I think now, having learnt from, from previous experience, they are being as open and honest with the public and with journalists as possible to the state of the head of state, uh, to the state of the monarch's health. Yeah, well, really briefly, Cameron, who's going to carry out the royal duties then that the Queen obviously can't go out and about and do? Well, it, well, it depends, Darren. I think she's already carrying out light duties, so she'll continue, as Ellie Costello was saying earlier, with those kind of video link and those signing of official documents and reading official documents um, of the country. But if um, her health takes a turn for wor worse and she can't carry out those duties, we have four councillors of state who can carry out those duties for her. They are Prince Charles, Prince William, Prince Harry or Prince Andrew. But of course, those last two, Prince Harry and Prince Andrew, could cause a bit of controversy. Yeah, well, Cameron Walker, GB News reporter, thank you very much for your time. Cameron is going to be busy all day with royal sources. You're with GB News on TV and DAB Radio will be going back to basics shortly. And our subject today is nuclear fusion. Now it's time for a check on the news headlines with Ray Addison. Thanks, Darren. It's, two, it's rather 34 minutes past two. Buckingham Palace has confirmed the Queen has tested positive for COVID. In a statement, the palace said Her Majesty is experiencing mild, cold-like symptoms but expects to carry out light duties this week. The head of state, who's 95, tested positive after coming in direct contact with her eldest son and heir, the Prince of Wales, the week he had the virus. The announcement comes just a few weeks after the nation's longest reigning monarch reached her historic platinum jubilee of 70 years on the throne. Buckingham Palace says she will continue to receive medical attention and follow all of the appropriate guidelines. The Prime Minister has warned that a Russian invasion of Ukraine would be the biggest conflict in Europe since World War II. This morning, explosions were heard in the rebel-held city of Donetsk in the east of the country, and the military reported the death of two soldiers. President Volodymyr Zelensky is calling for talks with Russia's Vladimir Putin in a bid to ease tensions. An amber weather warning has been issued for Northern Ireland, with Storm Franklin now hitting the UK. It comes just two days after Storm Eunice caused what providers say was the biggest national power outage on record. Yellow weather warnings are also in place for Wales and most of England, with winds of up to 70 miles per hour expected to cause more problems. And they've done it. Great Britain has claimed its first Olympic curling gold medal in 20 years. The women's team dominated the final against Japan to win an impressive 10-3. On TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Real Britain with Darren Grimes after this short break. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News.
I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, you're joining me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain on GB News. As you've heard, Her Majesty the Queen has tested positive for COVID-19. Buckingham Palace says the monarch is experiencing mild cold-like symptoms, but is expected to continue light duties at Windsor this week. And uh, just before we go any further, folks, to me, this suggests, you know, a 95-year-old with coronavirus who's carrying on with duties if this doesn't suggest that COVID is starting to, you know, we're starting to see the end of this, folks, I don't know what will. Royal photographer Ian Lloyd jo joins me now, though, and we're going to discuss the reaction to the actual news. What did you think when you first heard that this had happened, that the Queen has caught coronavirus? Hello, Darren. Uh, I should say former royal photographer, by the way. But um, yeah, I was obviously very um, concerned like the rest of us because the Queen is much loved. She's much respected. Uh, we wanted to celebrate her jubilee. And we're also quite frightened because once this raid ends, we don't know what's going to happen uh, to the royal family because they won't have the same uh, respect, I fear, that, that the Queen's always had. So uh, yes, it's, it was alarming news. But we just we just have to hope, like you say, that the, the virus is starting to... Uh, starting to fizzle out a bit and it is just like another cold i suppose and as someone who's you know you've experienced your fair share of uh, royal family updates do you think actually this message from the queen the fact that there has been a public statement the fact that there has been a statement that says the queen will be getting on with light duties do you think that this is a message to the nation that says keep calm and carry on <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I think they don't obviously want to alarm us, as your previous, uh, the royal correspondent you had on earlier said, um, when they didn't tell us that the Queen was in hospital, that's it, that that alarmed everybody. So I think they've learned from that and they want to, uh, to convey the news the Queen's got the virus, but they don't want to alarm anybody. And yes, the Queen's message, you remember, was uh, in the first broadcast she did about the virus was, you know, we'll meet again. It was a very uh, positive and forward thinking. And that's exactly how she is. She she would um, uh, say, you know, in her mind, let's get rid of this and then we'll get on with the next uh, thing. She's, she's uh, I once asked her cousin, Margaret Rhodes, how the Queen copes with pressure. And she said, well, she's very good at compartmentalising her life. In other words, she will think of something that's bothering her today and then forget about that. And the next day she'll think of something else and get on with that. It's, it's just how she operates. She doesn't uh, dwell on things. She doesn't uh, think, um, um, you know, about the, the what might have, what might happen. She just uh, gets on with life, I suppose. Yes, and, and Her Majesty the Queen, ultimately, 70 years as our head of state, she, she said it, it went before she was... Uh, the coronation that actually she, whether her life was long or short, you know, she would dedicate her life to this nation. I mean, she certainly has done that, but she really is resilience personified, isn't she? She's been through quite a lot throughout those 70 years. Yeah, absolutely. And her health generally been very good. She didn't go into hospital until she was about uh, approaching 60 when she went into hospital to have a, a wisdom tooth removed. And then in a, a few years ago, she went in, she had problems with her legs and knees. So she had that an operation on that. But uh, she's had really a very good um, uh, health, uh, health um, record. And a part of it is because her belief in uh, uh, you know exercise and going out and walking a lot and so on. I mean, she, she's... Um, as I say, she doesn't dwell on things. She doesn't uh, malinger as such. She goes out and, uh, and gets on with life. But uh, yes, and obviously she's got a great belief in homeopathic remedies. She always has, and uh, as her mother did as well. So uh, uh, I'm sure she's um, uh, looking at that as well as conventional medicine. Yeah, I'm wondering if I can just get your opinion on the prime ministers at the moment saying, 
it's in all over the press this morning that the two billion pound figure for testing is actually too much and we need to start scaling that back and learning to live with this. Do you actually think that this announcement from the Queen, who is in immensely popular, as you well know, do you think actually that this announcement will terrify people, will make people think, well, actually, I disagree with the Prime Minister. I think actually we should continue testing people. We should continue some of the COVID restrictions. Do you think this sort of hits back, essentially, at what the Prime Minister has been arguing over recent days? I wouldn't have thought so. I think because the um, I think we all know of people who um, friends, family, uh, colleagues, people, the, the word is that um, it's it's not as, as um, it's contagious, the latest Omicron variant, but it's not as uh, deadly. And certainly the statistics that we see in the, uh, certainly in our local paper here, that, you, you, you know, there are less people in, in hospital and less deaths and so on. So I think people are aware it's, it's, um, um, it's, it's lighter than it was. And certainly looking back at the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic. I mean, that, that sort of just fizzled out eventually. And I think people are thinking this is going to be exactly the same. So I think there's great concern about the Queen, but I don't think it's going to affect the government policy. And I don't think people will be alarmed about it. And, and certainly we're imagine... reassured because she has the best health. Yes, and well, indeed, and, and you know, long may that continue. Who do you think you would be photographing were you to be, you know, still in your post now? Who do you think actually <laughs> will be taking over some of those duties? Um, well, obviously, it's the direct line of succession, isn't it, that um, should the Queen be incapacitated and not able to attend some of the key ceremonies of state, it will uh, uh, devolve to Prince Charles and Camilla. Uh, we saw that already, that the Charles is escorting his mother at the state opening of Parliament, and there was a state visit of um, Donald Trump and people like that, that um, Charles is very much... Um, dominant now and obviously William and Catherine because I think they're aware that Prince Charles's reign will be quite a short one obviously because of his age so like uh, Edward the seventh who succeeded Queen Victoria he only reigned for nine years and then it went to George the fifth so I think we'll be looking at the direct line of succession but um, um, and uh, certainly William and Catherine are going to play a, a great part in this year's celebrations I hope. Yeah I mean recent polling has shown us hasn't it that actually Kate and William are immensely popular as well. It just goes to show that the monarchy is, is actually one of those institutions in this country that has massive amounts of support. Yeah, and I mean, historically, it's a bit like going back to the time of Queen Victoria, who was revered at the end of her life. And people, you know, she reigned for 63 years and people couldn't imagine in those days life without her and um, most of the majority of her, the, her subjects had lived just through that reign. People didn't remember a former sovereign. And now you've got to be 80, approaching 80, to remember a time when there was a king and that we sang God Save the King instead of the Queen. So the Queen's been around for an enormous length of time and uh, the, is the last serving head of state who served in World War II. So it's a, a, an amazing contribution to, to national life, I think. Well, Ian Lloyd, I couldn't agree with you more. Former royal photographer, thank you very much for your time today. Now, there was a huge breakthrough this month, folks, that you might not be aware of, but it was very exciting. Nuclear fusion, the UK-based jet lab, has smashed its own world record for the amount of energy it can extract by squeezing together two forms of hydrogen. If it can be recreated here on Earth, it may be able to supply unlimited supplies of low emission energy. Now, I don't know about you looking at those energy bills at the minute. This is music to my ears. But what on Earth is nuclear fusion? Well, let's find out. There's nobody better to discuss this than Dr. Joe Milnes. He's the head of jet operations at the UK Atomic Energy Authority. That's quite the, the, the mouthful there, isn't it? First of all, just how significant is the breakthrough? Um, thanks. Yeah, your description was very good. You do, we've squeezed, we do squeeze hydrogen together at very high temperatures. The breakthrough we've had is, is very significant. Um, we've managed to create one of these many stars and get it to produce significant amounts of fusion energy and, and do that for a sustained period so that we can show we can stabilize the reaction and, and keep it going in, in conditions that are relevant to future power plant designs. So this is, this is a major step forward. 
And can you actually describe what nuclear fusion is? Because it's in this sort of donut shape, isn't it? And it, it's an intense reaction that we've not been able to. Is it the containment that's been the issue so far, or is it the actual creation of of the um, the well squeezing the two parts together in the first place? So it's it's we've been able to do fusion in, in our machine jet and in other machines around the world for some time. The the, the challenge is is keeping it going for more than a fraction of a, of a second. So yes, we, we have this donut shaped vessel that you described, um, and you put a, a tiny amount of fuel in there, and you heat that fuel up to 150 million degrees. So that's ten times hotter than the center of the sun. So that the hottest place in the galaxy is is just down the road in in Oxfordshire here. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you, the, the, the challenge is when, when gases get that hot, they don't want to stay hot for long. So uh, it's an incredible team of physicists and engineers that I work with have figured out how to, to do that and, and keep this very hot gas in one place. We use big magnets to keep, keep this gas in place and to get the conditions uh, that we need. And, uh, and uh, yeah, we've just um, delivered, a, as you said, we smashed the record and delivered a, a huge amount of fusion energy from, from this machine. Well, honestly, I mean, I, I send my absolute congratulations and thanks to all of you, because I really do think you're, you're heroes in what you're doing. I mean, how much would you say, the reason I wanted to cover this today is because actually this is a sign of the United Kingdom being leading, essentially, a world-renowned form of technology that, and I don't know about you, but I keep hearing about this and they keep saying, Oh, it's just a decade away, right? We're a decade away from this technology being mainstream and allowing us to actually reap the rewards of unlimited energy. But do you see this as, as Team GB actually stepping forward and showing that we do have a significant amount of clout in the world as far as science and research is concerned? I think that's true. I think uh, that's true generally in science, but certainly in fusion, the UK absolutely is is a world leader. But we certainly haven't achieved these results alone. This was the jet is a European machine of which the UK is a major contributor. So, so we had a major part to play in this. But we, we worked very closely with our colleagues from around Europe uh, over a decade to plan for these ex experiments. Um, but uh, so, yeah, credit to goes to. The, the, the whole team, but there's no question that the UK has been and continues to be a, a leader in the field. And we are continuing to work with our European partners and indeed our international partners. But we also just kicked off a very exciting UK project called STEP, which looks to build on these results and put uh, uh, net fusion power on the electricity grid for the first time. And that's a very exciting uh, a program that we're just getting going and, as I say, we'll build on these results and hopefully um, make us one of the first, if not the first, to put uh, to put power on the grid. Joe, what happens now then? Are you wanting to see more investment in research and development? Are you wanting to see more help from the, the government? What actually do we need to actually get this technology off the ground and start actually in, in well, essentially, uh, power in Britain, which is so exciting? But yeah, absolutely. Very, very exciting. Um, yes, I mean, I think investment is, is crucial it's because this is this really is the holy grail of energy production. If we can crack it, this, this sorts us out for thousands of years. So investment's key, both you know, public and private. It's very exciting at the moment that we're seeing a lot more private fusion players coming in and we're figuring out how to work with them, how to support, how to support them. Because the more, the more teams we have working on different concepts, different ideas on how to build on these results that we've just achieved, the more likely it is that we get fusion power soon um, and, uh, and you know, really solve one of the biggest challenges for, for humanity. Well, Dr. Joel Mailens, Head of Jet Operations at the UK Atomic Energy Authority, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. It's now 2.51. The Queen has tested positive for COVID. In a statement, Buckingham Palace said Her Majesty is experiencing mild cold-like symptoms but expects to carry out light duties this week. The announcement comes weeks after the Queen became the UK's longest reigning monarch, reaching her platinum jubilee of 70 years. Royal commentator Richard Fitzwilliams joins me now. Richard, what did you think when you heard this news? Well, firstly, I felt that Buckingham Palace were balancing the statement they put out very, very carefully. Because what we know, as you mentioned, uh, mild cold-like symptoms 
This is also balanced by the fact that the Queen will be continuing light duties. So, at the moment, they imply that there isn't any cause for particular concern, equally, of course, given the fact she will soon be 96. Mm -hmm. Obviously, people are worried. So what would light duties look like? Is this virtual conference calling? Is this working from home that we're all used to over the past two years? Well, the Queen has, uh, with reference to working from home, proved herself an expert in the virtual, and we saw that with her broadcasts, especially those last year. But on the other hand, it's obvious the reference is to her red boxes. Uh, she still has to sign laws, obviously, before they... Uh, become law, and uh, her duties as head of state, uh, very possibly uh, virtually, as she did this week, um, uh, greet ambassadors, receive ambassadors, and so forth. And she also, uh, in person, and she made a joke about being a little immobile, yeah. uh, received uh, members of senior members of the defence staff. But equally, there's no doubt at all that there is a concern, too, on an issue that came up earlier in this hour. That is, that in the event, which we hope is unlikely, that uh, the Queen was incapacitated, there are councillors of state who will then be doing duties, her duties, there would need to be two of them. Uh, when Prince Charles had COVID and Prince William was abroad, the only other two still are Prince Harry and the Duke of York. Now, that is something I feel ought to be looked at. But at the moment, of course, everyone's hope naturally is that the Queen will make a speedy recovery. And there are also reports that, I mean, who knows, that given the medical science that it's advances, if retrovirals were used, yeah. there are a whole variety of reasons why an age, a person's age, may not matter in this connection. On that point, on the medical point there, you talk about the breakthroughs that we've made over the past two years. Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, has said we need to learn to live with coronavirus and actually we're talking about Freedom Day on Thursday where restrictions will be lifted. And the Prime Minister himself has said that testing costing £2 billion is too much every single day. Too much. Does this change things? Do you actually think that the public, looking at the head of state, the immensely popular monarch, do you think the public say, hang on a minute, we need to pause here. We need to take this a little bit slower. I think that the boast that Britain was the first country in Europe to make the step was one that Prime Minister Boris Johnson was especially proud of. On the other hand, it's never had public support, so as far as I know, to go quite so quickly, quite so... Uh, quite. I mean, we are taking an enormous step. I mean, let us... Uh, Consider. It'll be very interesting to see the news conference and to see whether the scientists have precisely the same emphasis on exactly what the step involves when we come down to it. And that will be intriguing to see if there's any difference, which I think there possibly is. But people will obviously be drawn to yeah, this issue because of the... I think that's absolutely right. Thank you for your time. Now, Richard Fitzwilliams there. You've been watching Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Thank you very much for your company. The show is on every Saturday and Sunday at 2 p.m. But for now, I'll leave you with the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking wet and windy as Storm Franklin begins to move into the northwest. Let's take a look at the details. Zooming into the southwest, and the afternoon rain will have cleared, leaving a mix of clear spells and blustery showers. It'll be windy with gales along the coast. Across the southeast, it'll be a very wet start to the evening with some gusty winds around as well. The rain should turn more showery later on. Over to Wales now, and here we'll see plenty of showers, some of which will be wintry, especially over the mountains. Widespread gales are also likely around the coast. Let's head over to the Midlands and northwest of England, where we'll see plenty of showers this evening, but again, some being rather wintry over higher ground. It'll feel chilly as well, especially in the strong winds. Northeast England will get a little bit of shelter from the showers, but some will make their way across the Pennines. Winds will not feel as strong here, but it will be quite chilly too. Over in Scotland, there'll be plenty of showers, with some feeling wintry at times. Even at fairly lower levels, the strongest winds will be across the southwest with 
gales here. Turning to Northern Ireland now, and the winds here will continue to strengthen this evening with severe gales possible later. An amber warning will also come into a force later on tonight. OK, over tonight, Storm Franklin will continue with plenty of showers, very strong winds, especially across the northwest of the country. That's how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow. Hello, oh, my name's Dominic Frisby, and tonight at 11, two of the most entertaining characters from the UK comedy circuit will be joining me for Headliners to unearth the most important, the most interesting, the most irritating, and the most amusing stories from tomorrow's papers, thereby saving you the bother of having to read them yourselves. That's Headliners, the paper review show that won't send you to sleep, unlike all the others. 11pm on GB News. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp